Hi, welcome to the Bread and Roses program and I'm Fari Wurspuya. Hi everyone, I'm Mariam Namazi. In this week's program we want to discuss the issues surrounding the unfortunate and tragic death of Sahar Khoda, uh, Khodayari, the blue girl who uh, um, killed herself in Iran last week. We'll also be interviewing Vidu Viz. He's a YouTuber and comedian right here on this program. Don't go anywhere, stay with us. Everyone knows about the tragic suicide of Sahar Khodayari. She's being called the blue girl. She was uh, arrested when she tried to enter a football match at the Azadi Stadium. Ironically, it's, it's called Freedom Stadium. Uh, and because in Iran, women are not allowed to enter a sports stadium, she, had been, she was dressed as a, as a boy. She was found out and she was imprisoned. Uh, she was released on bail and uh, in September she went to court and she found out there that she would be given possibly six months and above sentence. And as a result she set herself on fire uh, and she died in hospital. Now the tragic thing about this case is that one, you know, she had done nothing wrong uh, but she was so incensed at her, what had happened to her that she felt she had no choice but to set herself on fire. And when you look at this case, really, you see the injustice of the system. One, that someone's arrested merely for attending a football match, mm -hmm. uh, wanting to attend a football match. And also the fact that, you know, they uh, went and buried her quietly uh, with, uh, and didn't even mention that she had died until after she was buried uh, silently and quietly. They put pressure on her family. They put pressure on journalists not to talk about her case. And then um, after it was found out and it became, you know, massive worldwide news, both in Iran and internationally, they went and started assassinating her character Absolutely. and I mean, who she was. Immediately the uh, spokesperson for the Iranian judiciary came to TV and said, actually there was no such a case. I mean, that's the initial reaction. And then when they came under pressure, they said, look, um, she wasn't arrested. Uh, for this because there was an issue of insulting the security uh, uh, people at the stadium and uh, eventually uh, under integration she, uh, um, uh, she, uh, she regretted what she had done and she wanted to make amends. At the same time while the spokesperson is giving this false news uh, starts to assassinate her character, said she, uh, she was bipolar, she was suffering from uh, mental health conditions and, uh, and this is tragic. I mean this is how the Islamic regime of Iran treats a major case of discrimination in Iran. A young woman, 29 year old, who achieved two degrees uh, in English and, and, and IT, uh, the, the push her to a point that she had to, she, she committed suicide. Rather than investigating the causes of this, of course they don't want to touch this, they start to assassinate her character. The reality is, though, that this is a regime that gives decades-long sentences to women who remove uh, compulsory veils in the public space, who have sentenced labor activists to 110 years in prison. So this is the type of regime we're talking about, and that often and routinely arrests girls and women who are dressed as boys trying to enter football stadiums. Uh, and also the very fact that she was free on bail makes it very clear that they were going to sentence her and that they are now trying to backtrack on the realities of the case in order to take attention away from themselves. And also, of course, in addition to the character assassination, they are blaming foreign enemies. Whereas in reality, the only enemy that can be seen against the people of Iran is this regime and its laws itself. You've got also members of the so-called Islamic Assembly, the so-called reformists who have said things like, uh, you've got Parvana Salah Shuri who said, and we are all responsible for the very many Sahars who commit suicide because there's a high rate of suicide of women in Iran. And of course, we are not all responsible. This regime is, you members of the Islamic Assembly are, Khamenei is, Rouhani is, those who have been setting up the system are responsible. Another so-called reformist, Tayebe Siyavashi, has said, oh, we don't know why so many people abroad are so concerned about 
cultural issues that are relevant only to Iran. Well, it's not just people abroad, it's people in Iran who are outraged at what's happened. Yeah, and, uh, and it's definitely not just a cultural issue. And of course, they want to marginalize the issue of discrimination and the e equality between uh, men and women. When the Islamic regime faced the whole barrage, a mass protest in Iran, uh, uh, you had the key uh, football players uh, demanded that discrimination ends and women allowed to come to stadiums. When you had even a, a spectators uh, demanding uh, equality and, and declared to be all humans, and they faced even in Afghanistan, you had Afghanistan, people expressed solidarity with Sahar and in a memory and in solidarity with women in Iran. Internationally, everybody started questioning the whole issue of discrimination in Iran. What the Islamic regime of Iran do? They immediately try to marginalize and say there are more important issues like wages. Suddenly, they, they become uh, sort of defenders of the higher wages for women when they, they face the issue of discrimination. Or they, they are more important like uh, bringing up children. Why are we sort of uh, uh, highlighting these marginal issues like uh, um, a child marriage or uh, um, the right of women to enter uh, stadiums which undermines the, the chastity and uh, of society and, and decency of society. You could see even in the attempt to marginalize uh, the, the poison of, the poison ideology of the Islamists and, and discrimination pours out and, and, and people should really, really condemn this regime and you can't compromise with these guys. Mm. Well, I mean, the thing is, too, that when you look at, uh, obviously, those who've protested in defense of Sahar Khodayari in Iran, they've been put under a lot of pressure. Her family's put on, been put under pressure, and uh, you've got, uh, you know, the Esterlal team, uh, before a match, they all put on T-shirts clandestinely. They had brought it on to the field without anyone knowing because they knew they would be prevented from doing it, but they had T-shirts on saying, um, with the blue girl's name on it. And so, you know, they are trying to uh, squell or suppress the protest, blame it on foreign agents. What's clear though, the protests are extensive in Iran. There's a lot of outrage around this issue. And again, they can try to trivialize it, but the reality is that uh, women, especially in Iran, uh, and anyone who loves a woman in Iran knows how unjust these laws are. I mean, it's not only about entering a football stadium. Uh, it's about the fundamental right for men and women to be equal, first of all. Uh, uh, you know, women being allowed to do what men are allowed to do in that society. But also it's about this system that's set up to enforce gender segregation. And again, segregation is something that is fundamentally based on the inequality between men and women. It is not, uh, you know, they often say it's to protect women's chastity. That's why we can't let them in a football stadium. Uh, things will go horribly wrong if they do. Whereas, in fact, we know that that's not the case. Forty years ago, women were allowed to go into stadiums in Iran. Iranian women sit alongside Iranian men in football matches outside of Iran all the time, and nothing happens. There's no, uh, you know, huge catastrophe and calamity. And so, fundamentally, it's about, um, you know, demanding both equality and an end to segregation, which is based on the inequality between men yeah. and women. And interesting that the the fight for equality against discrimination between uh, men and women is one of the major achievements of uh, uh, 20th century, 19th century. People have fought for this and is enshrined in many uh, constitutions. In part, I mean, look at the FIFA constitution. Mm -hmm. It's enshrined in FIFA constitution. The question is, why is FIFA still compromising and not enforcing its constitution on the Islamic regime of Iran. Why has it taken them 40 years? Now, after the death of the blue girl, Sahar, they, 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 they announced that they want to go to Iran to consider the possibility of allowing women to come into a stadium. When are you going to stop compromising with the Islamic regime of Iran? When are you going to actually insist on, um, on equality? It's interesting that FIFA General Secretary states that uh, uh, football is beautiful and it needs to help everybody. But when it comes to the right of women and equality between men and women, suddenly it becomes political. It's very clear that uh, politics should stay out of football. And football should stay out of politics. But they should, they should mix. I mean, there are 
of course, political issues between countries all over the world, but uh, this should not have an impact on, uh, on uh, football uh, uh, tournaments. On the contrary, football should be there and is there for all the people, for all the people uh, in Iran, for all the people in Saudi Arabia, for all the people in every country in the world. Obviously, you know, the guarantees must be there, uh, the safety must be there, uh, everything must be, must be uh, clear. But uh, I will talk with whoever I can talk uh, to make sure that we can make the people everywhere happy and that football wins at the end of the day. And the political issues, they can remain and they can be sorted out by somebody else. We will sort out football. The head of FIFA says that he understands that there are some challenges and some cultural sensitivities. What is culturally sensitive about equality between women and men? If there were stadiums in the world and countries in the world where black people were not allowed in, only white people were allowed, gay people were not allowed, only straight people were allowed, there would have rightly been an uproar and FIFA would have stopped it immediately. Why is it always when it comes to women's rights that they are considered cultural and, and trivialized and marginalized and therefore not taken seriously? FIFA has a responsibility to implement its own constitution and ban Iran from football matches until it allows women into the stadiums full stop. It is possible. Last week, the International Federation of Judo banned Iran because the uh, uh, Iranian Federation tried to manipulate matches so Iranian uh, Iranians wouldn't uh, compete with, with Israelis. And rightly so, the International Federation of Judo banned Iran. FIFA could exactly do the same. For the, for the important issue of equality between men and women, it's possible we demand, people of Iran demand that the, that the uh, Feder if International Federation of Football, FIFA, bans Islamic regime from any further international matches until they fully and unconditionally implemented the equality between men and women. Don't try to compromise with the Islamic regime of Iran. The Islamic regime of Iran is very clear they're not going to comp compromise. Listen to what Khamenei, the, uh, the, the head uh, um, criminal and the fascist criminal says about uh, the issue of um, uh, compromising with international agencies. <laughs> به شما بگن که اگر پلون مسابقه رو ندید اگر پلون کار رو نکنید اگر پلون جور ظاهر نشید پلون فدراسیون بین المللی پلون تشکیلات بین المللی از شما ناراضی میشه به درک که ناراضی میشه هیچ غلطی نمیتونن بکن Now clearly the fact that the regime is facing pressure that FIFA is facing pressure is a result of public outrage, both in Iran and internationally, and that outrage has to continue. Look, they are assassinating uh, uh, Sahar Khodayari's uh, uh, you know, life. They are calling her mentally ill. They are calling her bipolar. They are saying she, was, uh, you know, she didn't have all her wits about her. But this is a woman who has had two degrees, who has lived until the age of 29, who knew her rights enough to try to enter a football stadium dressed as a boy because she knew that was the only way she could enter. So in memory of her, uh, her life in, uh, and to commemorate that life, I think we all have a responsibility to keep that pressure on, to make sure that from now on um, and as soon as possible, without any delay, women are allowed into the stadiums in Iran. Men shouldn't go until they are. FIFA should ban uh, Iran until gender segregation is ended. You know, we owe it to Sahar Khodayari and we owe it to the women's rights movement in Iran to make sure that gender segregation in stadiums is eliminated once and for all. Program. I wanted to speak to you about your YouTube channel, which yeah. is quite well known. Um, 
it focuses on making fun of religion and also religious figures. Yeah. Tell me about that. Why do you think that's important? So I think for me, um, someone who's been very much interested in Islam, very much interested in debates as well, I, I found that there was a, uh, a dearth or a, a lack of comedy within the whole scene. So it's one thing to criticize Islam or religion in general, but it's one thing to ridicule and to show people how silly the ideas are through comedy. Um, so I was interested in comedy, I was interested in drama, so I thought why not um, satirize and make fun of some of the, most, the more popular speakers within Islam and maybe um, sort of expose the ir ir irrational beliefs in religion through comedy. So I think it's important to do that because that's one of the things that they don't like. Anyone, uh, any sort of dictator or any person who does not like being questioned hates ridicule because it, it shows people how silly their views are. And I mean, ridicule is sort of, really goes to the core of yes. things, doesn't it? Uh, and that's why it's so uh, frowned upon. Hmm. And also, there's so many laws against it. Exactly. I mean, we, you, if you want to speak about blasphemy law through the government or even in general society, people don't approve of you making fun of either religion or certain uh, political figures that are very powerful and uh, don't want their authority questioned. But if you're someone who's sincere and is looking for the truth, then if someone says, don't make fun of me, uh, don't make fun of me, then you say, well, why not? What do you have to hide? Especially if you, if you want my devotion and power and my uh, sort of uh, money or, or sort of anything. If, if you're asking me for something, then I have a right to question you and I have a right to make fun of you. And if someone says, no, you can't, then that's a very uh, big uh, red flag for me. There's a, another comedian um, of Muslim background. She sort of says that comedy breaks through the fear because mm. if you can laugh, uh, it sort of they don't. It doesn't have the same hold on you. Exactly. Um, that's a very good point because I remember in one of my videos I made fun of the whole day of judgment, the sort of Imam Mahdi coming, and this whole doomsday scenario. I I actually made fun of that in one of my videos, and someone who was a Muslim commented below saying, "I used to be so scared of this." But now I can't take it seriously anymore because now you've shown me how silly these things are. That the Mahdi will come, the earth will be upside down and people will be... This is silly. This is like from, from a movie, you know. And I think that that comedian is completely right. Once you make people laugh, you make them realize that this is all nonsense. Mm. What is um, the funniest things that you think you've done? Like what yeah, yeah, the things you really love from the videos you've made? Um, it's, it's a tough one because I think I've, I've done so many different types of videos. People have their own favorites. But one of the biggest favorites is Dr. Zakir Naik, who is this uh, sort of um, one of the biggest Muslim speakers in the world from India. And uh, he was very, or he has been very successful. You know, he draws big crowds to his events. And I started impersonating him just sort of as a joke, not even taking it seriously, but people really responded to that. So I'm the, the first, or one of the first videos I made was saying why nursery rhymes are haram. So, you know, I, I, I picked a few nursery rhymes like J uh, Jack and Jill went up the hill and then he said, well, why are they going together? You know, there should be no, no intermingling between the, you know, all the kind of genders <laughs> and twinkle, twinkle, little star. This is, this is referring to horoscopes and Islam, horoscopes are haram. And this little piggy went to the market. Of course, pigs are haram and all this kind of stuff. So when you start um, taking normal things like nursery rhymes and imposing that sort of Islamic doctrine or that very rigid way of looking at the haram, halal, haram, you realize, you know, what's going on here? This is nonsense. You know, so I actually, uh, I actually enjoy putting the religious on the mundane and showing people how silly this is. That's what I enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the... You, you mentioned your first video I read yeah. somewhere was about five things you need to be a sheikh. How to become a sheikh, yeah. five easy steps. So tell us, tell us about those easy steps. So um, <laughs> I have, when, when I was Muslim, I watched so many different videos of sheikhs, like Sufi, Sunni, uh, Shia, Salafi, all different types of sheikhs, and even sort of modern reformists. And I found that there was sort of, there was like a formula almost <laughs> to becoming a, a, a good sheikh. It was so formulaic. So I said, you know, I've seen so many videos on how to lose weight or how to do this or how to do your hair like this. Well, what about how to become a sheikh? So I picked five steps on how to become a sheikh. First, you've got to pick a title, you know, Imam, Mufti, Maulana, whatever, whatever. And then you've got to pick your persona. Are you the cool sheikh or are you the harsh sheikh or are you this and that? So for me, when I did that, it, it, that was, that's my Bible. That's my sort of foundation. If you want to know what video is about, 
watch that video because it's what, what you see is patterns emerging from all the different uh, shakes. It's very formulaic. And once you recognize those patterns, you can break it down and you can really break down their whole sort of, uh, sort of this big aura they have around themselves that they've got this turban, they've got this beard and you're scared of it. No, this is very formulaic and it's almost like they're factory produced, you know? <laughs> so that, that's what it is. So you were Muslim at one point yep. and then of course you're an agnostic atheist now. Yep. Uh, were you ever scared of making fun and what changed? So even when I was a Muslim, um, I remember when Charlie Hebdo happened um, and, and I was just thinking like even the Muslims around me who obviously don't condone the violence, even they were upset and they were like, oh, you know, they, they shouldn't have made fun of the Prophet and they shouldn't have drawn cartoons. But I was like, if I'm a Muslim and I believe in this religion and I have faith, why would stupid jokes or cartoons or anything like that, why, why would they hurt me or why would they offend me to the point where I now have to kill someone or be violent towards someone? So that really annoyed me that we have this uh, brittleness within the Muslim community that we can't take anything offensive, we can't take any jokes. So even as a Muslim, I wasn't scared of making jokes because I thought my personal belief was stronger than anyone's joke or cartoon. So obviously when I left Islam, um, this was one of my own personal projects that I have to uh, sort of encourage Muslims to laugh at themselves. Even if you remain Muslim and have very strong faith and belief in, in your religion, that doesn't mean if someone draws a cartoon, now you have to erupt with anger. Now you can't talk to them, now you can't do whatever it is. So this has been my personal project that I want Muslims to be able to laugh at themselves and encourage a healthy debate and discussion and to revive this tradition of ridicule. Because we, we ridicule our politicians, we ridicule our celebrities, we ridicule everyone, just like everyone else. But when it comes to religion, we're very hush-hush. And I think anyone who's asking power from you, you should have a very healthy level of skepticism and ridicule. I mean, this is also relatively more recent with the rise of Islamism because yep. there is a long history of ridicule exactly. and religion. So yep. you're basically just doing what's been done historically. I'm so. not doing anything new. In fact, I would say I'm uh, reviving, like you said, an old tradition that existed in many Muslims' lands of sort of lampooning the sheikh or uh, making fun of the Maulana. And uh, it was accepted, you know, fine, they were religious people. But, you know, at the same time, they're like, this guy shakes a bit dodgy or he's a bit funny. Um, I remember one, uh, I think it was Pervez Hoodboy, saying that, you know, in the sort of early uh, days of Pakistan, like, it was a normal thing to make fun of the, the Maulana. You know, it was, a, it was a normal thing. But then, some, some, I think, after the 70s, now the Maulana's got status, you can't question him, you can't touch him, and he's very, you know, you, people are very scared um, to point fingers. But this was something which was, I mean, this is not even that long ago. People used to make fun of the sheikh. So, and, and they were still Muslim, so I don't see why it can't happen today. Do you think there's a limit to comedy, though? Like, do you think, I mean, how far do you think mm. people are allowed to go? Is there a, a limit? This is uh, a question which is very hotly debated nowadays, especially with uh, sort of political correctness. I mean, even not with Islam, just like, can you make fun of, um, I don't know, the gen uh, gender differences or different races or different things and so on and so forth. For me, number one thing is what is your intention and who is your audience? If, if the audience knows that you're just making fun of a, even a very serious topic, but you're sort of just trying to maybe point out the silliness in human beings, I, I have no problem with that. And the limit, how do you know you've got to the limit? The, the only way you know is when you've crossed it. So you've got to, so comedy is actually quite brave. You've got to be brave in the sense that you know this joke could make someone laugh or it could be like, oh, did that guy go too far? But you don't know until you've gone there. So I would say the comedians should be allowed to explore and the people watching the comedy should give them some leniency because one joke they might get it 100% right, the other joke they might fall flat, uh, flat on their face. Uh, but obviously with any speech, the limit is you cannot draw to uh, violence. You can't say we need to get these people or kill them or take away their rights. That kind of stuff. So, so that's not really free speech anymore, is it? That's it's not free speech anymore. To violence, right? Exactly. Well, you've crossed that line then. But is there a limit to criticizing religion, an idea? Ideas for me are uh, free, free game. Because I say, if you know, any idea, whether it's political or religious, they have a certain view of the world. If they want me to accept it, then they have to convince me. I have a right to give them my view of their view. And if I do it through debate, through writing articles, through movies, through comedy, that's completely fine. So there's no limit in terms of 
ridiculing religion or any uh, you know capitalism, communism, whatever whatever ism or schism, you should have every right to criticize and ridicule. What about have you done videos on criticizing Islam itself versus or the Hadith or? I, for my main focus has been things like apostasy law, blasphemy law. I have criticized uh, Islam when it comes to scientific miracles. Uh, for me, that was actually one of the main reasons why I actually left Islam, because um, I tried really hard to reconcile science and religion. And obviously, you know, someone like Zakir Naik, he was saying that you know, science and religion are compatible, the scientific miracles. But obviously, the deeper I researched, I found out this was not true. So I have touched upon science, I have touched upon blasphemy, I have touched upon uh, apostasy. I even touched upon uh, Muslims, um, uh, they say uh, that, that in the Bible prophesies Muhammad and all this kind of, that's not even true because they, they had no idea who Muhammad, or who Muhammad was. Of course, the Bible and Torah are false themselves, but even then there is some sort of integrity within those uh, scriptures. So I, I have t I, I've actually um, done that as well, and those videos actually came later, um, but I, my main thrust has been comedy. So, I mean, just, I, I suppose, as a uh, final question, uh, I mean, this importance of laughing yeah. at silly ideas mm. and also laughing at yourself. You, know, you mentioned that. Why is that so key for any sort of change in the world, in your opinion? Like, why, why yeah. do you do it? I think laughing and humor is some sort of evolutionary mechanism. You, you, I mean... Human beings have, I mean, we spoke about comedy and we spoke about, is there a limit? I mean, in Europe, the overwhelming sort of history of comedy has been Jewish people, Jewish comedians. And they've been through, you know, hell, you know, whether it's the Holocaust or even before that. And they ridicule themselves uh, all the time. And in fact, they said this is a, a coping mechanism, that in this uh, life that we have so much struggles and pain, one of the ways to get through it is by, by, by laughing at ourselves. And I think, you know, every community, every individual goes through many ups and downs, hardships. But there's no reason why we can't take a step back and say, isn't it kind of funny or silly that this, this, is, this uh, situation that we're in and uh, we try and do one thing and something else happens and so on and so forth. So, you know, lo life is funny. You know, it, it can be sad, it can be amazing, but it's also funny. And I don't see why we should deny ourselves that dimension of our lives from an individual level or on a community or humanitarian level. And I think it's a great... Uh, coping mechanism. So one more question. Go for it. Actually. The last question I'd like to ask is, I mean, do you, what about, you know, those who say you shouldn't be offending and comedy can be really offensive, mm. you know? Yeah. So um, being exposed to offensive jokes, offensive material, offensive ideas is part of your intellectual development. The same way you go into the gym, the next day you're sore, you should also have those mental calluses that how am I going to get over this? You expose yourself to new ideas, you know, as, as challenge yourself and challenge other people. That's how you're going to get through this. And that's how you're going to reach the no. truth, whatever that is. We've come too far to give up on the mark. So let's raise the bar and our hands to the stars. She's up all night to the sun. I'm listening to the Azan She don't do any haram I'm up all night to put her a week. We're up all night to the sun We're listening to the Azan We don't do any haram We're up all night to put her a 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 We're up all night to put her a
Thank you.